as we think about the faithfulness of our God, I was thinking about Lamentations chapter 3. This is a book of lament. It's a book of sorrow and brokenness. And here's what we see in Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. May that be our prayer. Let's pray right now. Lord God, we come to you today because we recognize that you are a God of faithful love. And because of your faithful love, we do not have to be despairing. Lord God, we know that your faithfulness is new every morning. And so we say you are our portion, God. Let us put our hope in you today, and may we do that as we open your word from the book of Proverbs, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and through the, uh, through the work of your spirit, and everybody said, amen, amen. Does anybody watch the show Antique Roadshow? Anybody watch that? Go ahead and raise your hand. If you've watched that, maybe just for a few minutes, just to see if there's any... Hidden Treasures. Anybody watch that show? Okay. So I, I, this is such a great show. Uh, I haven't watched it a lot, but when I have had the opportunity, I'm like, oh, I haven't watched this for a while. You know, I don't know when it's on, but I love the reactions people have when they have this certain item and, and they say, this is worth thousands of dollars and oh, like freaking out. Here's another one. What? <laughs> okay. Here's another one. Oh. Okay, so I've got a story for you. This is a true story from Antique Roadshow. Uh, Don't show the picture yet. A college-bound student, listen, a college-bound student uh, was ready to pack up her recently inherited framed picture from her grandmother to bring to school. But the beloved picture that hung over her grandma's bed had a pesky mosquito under the glass. She took the picture outside to open it and realized the picture could actually be a painting, not a print. This led to two appraisals valued at $200 and $250. However, Antique Roadshow appraiser Meredith uh, Hilf- uh, I knew I'd screw this up. Hilferty, Meredith Hilferty, this is an Antique Roadshow appraiser, said it was worth much more. The painting, now let's see it, take a look at it. Let's put it up. This painting was painted around 1892. It was done by Henry Francois Farney, a French-born American painter well-known for painting Native Americans. What's especially interesting about this painting is the dense grouping, which is highly desirable in his work. The granddaughter was stunned to find the auction value is two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. Now. We all have something more valuable than this painting. It's right under our noses, and it's been there all along. If we would simply recognize it and take it, you know what it is? It's God's wisdom. God's wisdom is valuable. We're going to talk about that. We're going to see the value of God's wisdom. So turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, page 556 in the hardback, if you grabbed one of these Bibles off the cart as you came in this morning, page 556, uh, Proverbs chapter 3 is where we're going to start today in verse 13. What we're going to see in the Proverbs this morning, mainly in chapters 2 and 3, is that wisdom is valuable, wisdom is available, and wisdom is foundational. Wisdom is valuable, wisdom is available, and wisdom is foundational. So that's your outline. Number one, wisdom is valuable. Let's take a look at the value of wisdom starting in Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. Look at the text, Proverbs 3, 13. Happy is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and her revenue is better than gold. She is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can equal her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant and all her paths peaceful. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her, and those who hold on to her are happy. This section of Proverbs is encapsulated around a word. Did you notice what it was? What's the word that starts verse 13 and the word that ends verse 18? What's the word? 
happy. Or if you're reading another translation, ESV says blessed, blessed, happy. Why is one happy or blessed when they find wisdom? Because wisdom is valuable. It's valuable. Notice, uh, I want us to notice this. Notice the personification in verse 14. Wisdom is a she. Did you see that in verse 14? Wisdom is a lady. And all God's ladies said, okay, well. No, Ken, you're not supposed to say amen. You're, all God's ladies say amen. You just had to. You, you got one with you, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's right. All right, the main point of this Again, is wisdom is valuable, and wisdom in Proverbs is often is personified as a she. Uh, so that when it says she, it's speaking of wisdom. So wisdom is worth more than silver and gold, according to verse fourteen, and jewels, according to verse fifteen, or even we could say antique paintings. Wisdom is worth more than one of those. We could say wisdom is better than a whole house of hussars in West Bend. It's worth more than that. See the end of verse 15. Look at the end of verse 15. What does it say? Nothing you desire is better than wisdom. Verse 16. Long life, riches, and honor are for those who attain wisdom. Verse 17. The way of wisdom is the way of what? Peace or shalom. Shalom. Verse 18. Wisdom is actually, what does it say? A tree of life. Wisdom is a tree of life. Of life. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Seems like I've heard about a tree of life before, like at the beginning of the Bible and at the end of the Bible. Perhaps this is a reference to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, the, li- the tree that gives life for eternity. If it doesn't refer to the, that tree of life, uh, as commentators tell us that it certainly stands for goodness and blessing. Wisdom is valuable. We can recognize that today. It's very clear in God's word. But the question is do I value wisdom? Do I value wisdom? Maybe you're asking yourself that question. Do I value it? Now, I just want to tell you, this is just just free advice here. If people call you a wise guy, it's not an indication that you value wisdom. (laughs) It's ironic, actually, that we use this phrase, wise guy, uh, and this wise guy is often anything but wise, right? But let's consider whether we really value wisdom. I'm going to give you three evidences that perhaps you do not value wisdom. Three evidences that I do not value wisdom. Number one, I am not teachable. That's, that's a giveaway. That, that tells us you do not value wisdom. I'm not teachable. So let me give you examples. When my parents give me advice, I cringe and argue. Arr. Yeah, but, yeah, but. I'm not teachable. When teachers or coaches give instruction, I get mad, out of proportion. They're wrong. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing it right. You're not teachable. You don't value wisdom. When my boss points something out I can work on, I blow him off or I blow her off and I say, what does he know? She doesn't know what she's talking about. If this is you, you are not teachable or you're not teachable enough and you need to grow uh, in a teachable spirit. If you're not teachable, then you probably don't value wisdom. Second, I'm self-centered. I'm self-centered. I don't think much of others or their interests, or perhaps on the other side, I envy others. I want what others have, and I'm angry and jealous. This attitude of the heart reveals that you do not value God's wisdom. How do I know? Because this is a characteristic of worldly wisdom, according to the book of James, not godly wisdom. James says this in James 3, 13, I'm sorry, 3, 14 through 15, it says, but if you have bitter envy, see this, but if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. If all you can think about is yourself, me, 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 my, 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 you're buying worldly wisdom, and it is unspiritual and even demonic. If this is you, you do not value God's wisdom, that God's wisdom is wisdom from above, and you can read more about that in James chapter 3. Here's the third evidence that I do not value wisdom. I am proud. I am proud. Later in James, we see James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to who? To the humble. 
1 Peter 5.5 5, echoes James 4. It says, all you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Peter and James, the, the human authors of these letters, think about this, they, were, they knew the Old Testament. They had memorized it as boys. They were Jewish through and through, and they knew the Proverbs. They had known these words, and certainly they knew Proverbs 3.34, which is the proverb that they are both quoting. Proverbs 3.34, look at it up on the screen. It says, he mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. So he is God, mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. So James and Peter interpret the first line of Proverbs 3.34 to mean that God actually opposes the proud. He mocks those who mock. He opposes the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. So what does it say about pride? Pride prevents wisdom. If we are proud, we will be self-centered. And we will not be teachable. You see how pride kind of links them all together. To gain wisdom, we must humble ourselves. We need to respect God as God. We must also recognize who we are. We are frail and needy. We are a mist that appears and then is gone Psalm 90 verse 12 instructs us, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. You see the humility in Psalm 90? Teach us to number our days. Okay, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to say, this is who I am. I'm frail. I'm needy. I am a mist that appears. And that is how we gain a heart of wisdom, if we're humble. But if we're proud, we will not gain a heart of wisdom. So you may be wondering, well, how can I learn the value of wisdom? How can I value wisdom in my life? Well, look to the wisest man who ever lived. And I'm not talking about the human author of Proverbs. Not Solomon, because ultimately he was a fool in the end, wasn't he? Who do we look to? We look to the man to whom Solomon pointed, the greatest king, Jesus. He is Jesus Christ, is the wisest person who ever walked this earth. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 42, listen to this, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is greater than Solomon in his wisdom. Je see, think about this. Jesus took the posture of wisdom by being teachable Luke 2, 52 says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus took the posture of wisdom by being teachable. Jesus also took the posture of wisdom by being others-centered, centered, not self-centered. Jesus was with his disciples after an intense season of ministry, and they planned to get some rest, but the crowds found them, and Mark tells us in Mark 6, 34, when he went ashore and he saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Jesus didn't tell the people to go away. I need some time to myself. No, he was others-centered, not self-centered. So he took the posture of wisdom. Finally, Jesus took the posture of wisdom by humbling himself. In fact, he humbled himself so much that he submitted to his Father's will and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, it says in Philippians 2. Think of this, Jesus, Jesus did not mock those who mocked, which is what Proverbs 3.34 says. Instead, listen to what the Roman soldiers did, according to Matthew 27. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They even spat on him and took the staff and kept hitting him on the head. And they had mocked him. And after they mocked him, they stripped him of uh, the robe, put on his own clothes, uh, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. So all this happened because you and I sinned. We were foolish and disobeyed. We were not teachable. We were not self centered. We were not, we, we were proud. We rebelled against an infinitely holy God, and the only just and righteous punishment for these offenses is an infinitely terrible punishment, which is eternal separation from God and all that is good. And Jesus 
stepped in and he took the hit for us. Jesus died in our place to reconcile us to God. He took the punishment our sins deserved. This is the gospel. This is the good news. It is the most glorious news in the history of the world. So have you responded to this good news? What do you do to respond? You repent of your sin, turn away from your sin and your attempts to be good enough before God and believe and trust Christ to be your savior once and for all. I hope that if you've never done that today, you would do it right now in your heart, in your, where you're seated, where you're listening. Wisdom is valuable because it comes from God and is, is displayed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, our Savior. Wisdom is valuable. Second, wisdom is available. Wisdom is available. Before we look at chapter 2, I, I do want to go there. We first need to look at Proverbs 1. So turn there. Just flip over to Proverbs 1. You may not have to flip at all. It's just right there. Proverbs 1, 20 through 23. Look at verses 20 through 23 of Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 20. Wisdom calls out in the street. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. How long, inex inexperienced ones, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? If you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and teach you my words. I just love this picture. Wisdom is not hiding. It's not a secret. In fact, God's valuable wisdom is available. Wisdom calls, look at this, wisdom calls out in the public squares, not quietly, not timidly, no, wisdom cries out loudly above the commotion, it says in verse 21. Hello, I'm here. Wisdom is available. It's out there. It's not a secret. God's wisdom is not a mystery. It's not buried. It's available, in fact, attainable, like a diamond sitting on the ground in the open. Wouldn't you grab it and just cherish it forever? Of course, and we should do the same with wisdom, God's wisdom. So let's turn over to Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 2. We're going to look through uh, several verses here in Proverbs 2. If God's wisdom is available, we should desire it. If it's valuable and it's available, we should desire it. L let's look first at evidence that I desire, that I'm desiring wisdom. Uh, evidence I de I'm desiring wisdom. Verse 1. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Now, just pause there. We can see some action words here. Evidence that I'm desiring wisdom. We see a teachable spirit is described. Someone with a teachable spirit will accept, store up, listen closely, direct their heart to understanding God's wisdom. Wisdom is available and a teachable spirit is evidence that we desire wisdom. Second, we see the initiative to get wisdom. It takes initiative to get wisdom. Initiative to get wisdom. Verses 3 through 5. Look at verse 3. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift up your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Attaining wisdom is not a passive activity. As in, well, I hope that wisdom drops down into my lap today. We can't just wait and hope maybe it'll just fall into our brains and our hearts, that wisdom will just show up. No, it, it, it takes initiative. It takes action. You see in these verses, verses 3 through 5, it says, call out to insight. Lift up your voice to understanding. Seek it like silver. Search for it like hidden treasure. We need to take initiative to get wisdom. Third, we see the Lord's generosity with wisdom. The Lord's generosity with wisdom. Verses 6 through 15. Verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Now, just stop there for a moment. Where does, where does God's wisdom come from? It comes from God. God gives generously, in fact, when we ask. According to James 1, 5, we see, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all, what does it say? Generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. See, God loves to give us wisdom when we seek it. 
He smiles as he generously gives wisdom to those who ask. Now look at verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8 in Proverbs 2. He stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his faithful followers. God's wisdom promotes human flourishing. It is for our good. This theme continues in verses 9 through 15. Look at verse 9. Then you will understand righteousness, justice, and integrity, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight you. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom guides us into righteousness. You see this? Righteousness, justice, and integrity. It will be a delight to us. Wisdom protects us. It rescues us even. Look at verses 12 through 15. Verse 12. It, this is wisdom, will rescue you from the way of evil. And anyone who says perverse things from those who abandon the right paths to walk in ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. So here's the question. How does wisdom rescue us? Well, when our friends, our coworkers, or even family members lead us in the wrong direction, the way of sin, the way of destruction, wisdom can save us from going along with them. They may be saying, hey, come on, it's going to be fun. Join us. Wisdom will set off alarm bells. Ding, 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 ding. Don't do it. Don't go there. Don't partake. Don't start. Wisdom will save us from the ways of the wicked. And if these people persist in going in that direction, wisdom will tell us to keep our distance from them. God's wisdom is for our ultimate good. It is valuable. It is available. Third, God's wisdom is foundational. God's wisdom is foundational. Now let's turn over to chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. I know we're jumping around, but that's the way Proverbs is. So get used to it. It'll be this summer, jumping around in Proverbs. Wisdom is foundational. Verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Look at verse 19. The Lord founded the earth by, what does it say? Wisdom. The Lord founded the earth by wisdom and established the heavens by understanding. By his knowledge, the, waters, the watery depths broke open and the clouds dripped with dew. Now, just consider this. God's wisdom created the earth. It was by God's wisdom that the earth was created. Raymond Ortland Jr. makes this point. He says, we have been told that the universe just happened. We have been told that we emerged out of the primordial goo by sheer luck. But the truth is, God created all things, and the tool he used was his own wisdom, and it was all he needed. In verse 20, we have a picture, you see? We have a picture of how God supplies the earth with water. That is just one description of how God's creation is wise. Now, if we think about the context of an ancient farm in Israel, they didn't have great irrigation systems, okay? Okay. Just think about this. They depended on the rain completely to provide for their families. And farms in Israel, most of them were several hundred miles from the Mediterranean Sea. And when I was in Israel, I remember uh, seeing storm clouds come from the west toward Israel. And you can see this is a picture of Jerusalem. And you can see some of the clouds covering over and coming. Rain is coming. You could see it. You could see it coming for miles and miles. But let's just consider this. And I read this this week. This is really interesting. How does the field get rain? By God's wise design. I read this week that if one inch of rain falls on one square mile of farmland, it requires 27,878,400 cubic feet of water. That's 206,000. 206 million, sorry, 206 million, 360 gallons of water, which amounts to 1,650,500, I'm sorry, I I can't even get the numbers right, 1.6 billion pounds of water. Would you call that heavy? That's heavy. That's a lot of water. 
for one inch of rain to fall on one square mile of farmland. So this billion and a half pounds of water evaporates. It's filtered in the air and is carried in the clouds to the field, to that particular field. Then does it all drop at once? Boom! 1.6 billion pounds of water? No. It would destroy everything if it did. But in God's wise design, condensation happens and the water becomes small between 0.00001 and 0.0001 centimeters wide. The water gets small, and the sky dribbles this billion pounds of water on a field to provide for one family. So what is the point? If God, by wisdom, designed water in this way to provide perpetual rain, what will he accomplish with his wisdom in us? What will he accomplish with his wisdom in us? Wisdom is foundational, and it should be the foundation of our lives Look at verse 21. Maintain sound wisdom and discretion. My son, don't lose sight of them. I just love this picture. If wisdom is valuable, available, and foundational, I should keep looking for it. I should keep seeking it. When I'm in a store with my daughters, I don't lose track of them. I know know where they are especially when they're young. I know as parents who have young kids, you cannot take your eyes off of them, right? You have to know where they are at all times. Why? Because you don't want to lose them. And they're valuable to you, so valuable. And the same is true of wisdom. Don't lose sight of it. It is foundational to your life. In fact, wisdom is life. Look at verses 22 to 26. Listen, listen, verse 22. They will be life for you. These words of wisdom will be life for you and adornment for your neck. Then you will go safely on your way. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, you will sleep. Your sleep will be pleasant. Don't fear sudden danger or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from a snare. To trust the Lord's wisdom is to trust the Lord himself. Trust the Lord's wisdom. Brother, brothers and sisters in Christ, may we see that wisdom is valuable, it's available and foundational, and we all need it. We all need wisdom. May wisdom be life for us, something that we keep around us always like a necklace. May we seek it for the treasure that it is. Church, may we remember Christ, our Savior, and the power Christ our Savior, in fact, is the power and wisdom of God. May we see Jesus on the cross dying for us, raised to new life ahead of us, and at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And Jesus sent his Spirit to indwell us and lead us into all truth and wisdom. He has given us all we need to live a life of wisdom. Last week we talked about the fear of the Lord. You remember the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is seeing its value and seeking it. May we do that this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you that you have made your wisdom available to us. And we recognize its eternal value. Its value in our lives to keep us from harm, to keep us from evil. We recognize its value to glorify your name to live lives that, that, that honor you and glorify you. I pray that this week that we would apply your wisdom. Lord, help us to learn and grow. Help us to learn to be teachable. Help us, God, to learn to be others-centered. Even as we go home this afternoon, help us to be others-centered. I pray that we would learn to humble ourselves before your mighty hand. Because in our humility, there we will find wisdom. Lord, give us wisdom today. Give us wisdom as we go into this week and as we take communion together this morning. Lord, may we have the wisdom to see and understand what you have truly done for us on the cross for our sins so we can be reconciled to you. And we pray all this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus.